Good evening, everyone. My name is Katie. I'm Varsha. And I'm Lilybeth. And our capstone project is Open Passive House, making a business case for multifamily affordable passive house. So we will preface by explaining what passive house is for those of us who are not familiar. Passive house is a design standard intended to reduce a building's energy use, guided by a set of principles that limit the transfer of heat between the interior and exterior of the building. Some of the main design principles include creating an airtight envelope, having continuous insulation, using high performance doors and windows, incorporating energy recovery ventilation systems, and thermal bridge free design. Passive House is pretty popular in Europe and has gained some traction here in pockets around the United States. And given the rising levels of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, more cities and states are adopting initiatives to lower their greenhouse gas emissions. Passive House has demonstrated success for decades, and if given the chance, can contribute greatly in efforts to curb emissions. At this time, however, there is a lack of data to prove the energy savings that Passive House provides, particularly in the large multifamily sector. And we acknowledge that Passive House building may cost more upfront, but should show cost savings time in the form of energy savings. And performance data on Passive House projects would be critical for underwriters who determine whether a building should receive a loan. The basic structure of underwriting low-income housing loans considers how the building can serve as an asset to generate cash flow and from that cash flow generate capital. The net operating income, or NOI, determines the net value of a building and is calculated by taking the effective revenues and deducting the estimated maintenance and operation costs, or the MNO, as well as the real estate taxes and other costs. And the cap rate, which is calculated by taking the NOI and dividing by the market value of the building, ultimately dictates the amount that can be borrowed. I know that's a lot of information thrown, thrown out at you, but the bottom line is that most of the inputs in the calculation um, to determine how much can be borrowed are fixed, except for the MNO. So if there were data that could prove that passive house projects have lower MNO costs compared to traditional projects, it could allow for a higher extension of credit and in turn actually reduce the need for public sub subsidies. And there's a typical chicken and egg, egg situation at play here. Lenders won't underwrite the more expensive passive house projects because there isn't enough data to support the cost savings over time. But there isn't enough data to support the cost savings because not enough lenders will underwrite passive house projects. And so about a year and a half ago, a group of people from different organizations, including New York City Housing Preservation and Development, or HPD, Community Preservation Corporation, or CPC, Bright Power, and Stephen Winters Associates, came together to try to come up with ways to solve the problem. They were able to gather some data from a few passive house uh, projects in the city and compared their findings against data from typical buildings of similar size. So we joined the project to support phase two and with them determined how to grow this project. Um, we needed to come up with a way to get more projects to provide information in a standardized, streamlined way. Uh, professionals from Building Energy Exchange have also recently joined the project. Our project objective was to bridge the data gap to support the underwriting process and conv convince lenders that passive house buildings are worth the investment. So as we planned our data collection process, we settled on these key components. Developing a user-friendly survey to serve as the primary means of data collection, identifying additional multifamily passive house projects all around the country, and identifying the best person, contact person for each of those new projects, such as the architect, the developer, or the contractor. And it was critical that the survey that we created be as automated as possible by incorporating single choice, multiple choice, check all that, and check all that apply answer choices wherever we could. Providing uh, answer choices for the respondents to choose from also allowed that standardized and, st and streamlined uh, process. So we, be we began to develop a survey which consisted of five categories. The first category calls for basic information. 
with the questions about the project, like the location, the size, completion date, and unit mix. And the design and operations category asks questions about all about the mechanical systems in the building with uh, lots of choices already built in. The design and construction cost section asks mostly ballpark questions in, related, in relation to the responders baseline buildings. Because if we ask someone who, is always, who always builds passive house buildings, if their passive house build was more expensive, they'll probably say no. But if their baseline building is, is typically just code compliant, then it's likely that the passive house is, was more expensive. Uh, we also asked in this section if they would be willing to share their utility data with us, possibly via, via Energy Star Portfolio Manager. So in the performance section, we asked uh, we ask performance-based questions based on the building's modeling demands, such as the heating and cooling demand, heating load, et cetera. And lastly, we asked a, a few qualitative questions in the end. Most of them are optional, but it was a chance to dig a little deeper and find out why they chose to pursue Passive House on their project and what were some of the challenges along the way. Our goal was to capture everything needed uh, for a true picture of the components of each of the projects to weigh against their energy performance data. We also knew it needed to be doable in under 10 minutes to feasibly get respondents. Some questions were optional, so it wouldn't bog down the people who just wanted to get in there and finish it quickly. And at the end, we also asked uh, each of the respondents if we could reach out to them for more questions. So after many rounds of fine tuning the survey, we decided that the survey needed a landing site to live on. And this would also help to establish legitimacy for the project. So we built a website using the CUNY Academic Commons. The survey lives on the landing page and it can be filled out directly via Google Forms. And it's also available for download as an Excel or a PDF. The next tab is the, uh, the about page. I think we just skipped it, Katie. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, so the about page is where we introduce the origins of the project, the key players and the purpose of the project. And then this page, this is a sharing data page and it's intended to serve as a secure way for submitters to share their monthly energy usage data and cost data with us. So essentially submitters could create an account and share their property profiles with us using Energy Star Portfolio Manager, which is an online tool used to track and record building energy data. And alternatively, they could also share a spreadsheet with monthly data as well. It was important that we have a case study page as it served to materialize the project in a way that showed what could be produced from the survey and the opportunity to have a case study page for a project also served um, to incentivize people to complete the survey. So the case study template was really a simple one pager that captured basic project information like location, gross square footage, year of completion, as well as a brief uh, project description and any special or, no or noteworthy features. And the information used to populate these templates comes from the survey submissions. So after putting the website together and the website finally went live, it was at that point that we were ready to begin disseminating the survey and conducting outreach. So to support our outreach efforts, we designed assets for sharing on social media. And we also created an Instagram account for the project, as you can see here. And so putting this all together, now that we have a live website, we have social media assets ready for sharing, we then began to start re reaching out to networks and organizations within the Passive House community, asking them to promote the project in their newsletters, their websites, and social media accounts. This helped to get more eyes on the project and direct it to the survey. And so here you can see the, the, the uh, Instagram accounts of the North American Passive House Network and 475 High Performance Building Supply. They both share it on their Instagram accounts. And on the bottom, you can see the project shared on the New York Passive House website. 
So after laying down the foundation, we could then receive the survey submissions and begin to represent the data graphically. We received a total of nine submissions and out of which only five were usable for the study. The unusable four submissions had either incomplete data, less than five units, or were single family homes. We compiled a list of passive house projects, gathered contact data, and reached out to multiple projects directly to fill in the survey. But we were only able to receive one more submission before running out of time on this project. The su that submission had incomplete energy data, so unfortunately, it couldn't be included in the study. Based on the submissions, received, we noticed that larger promotional outreach was more effective than targeted outreach to get people up to fill out the survey. With the data we did receive, we made a few graphs for the analytics page on our website to give a snapshot of the helpful results we could yield. This would help people understand how we were using the data and convince more people to fill out the survey. Energy savings is an important part of passive houses. To see how a passive house building performs compared to a conventional building, we compared the average source EUI of our submissions to multi multifamily residential housing average sourced from the Energy Star Portfolio Manager. The submitted building's average was less than half of the multifamily housing average, which shows that passive houses are better at energy savings. The collected data also showed that builders opted for additional features like solar PV and emergency generators. Apart from the performance of the building, collecting cost data was also essential for the study. Majority of the respondents said that additional hard cost of passive house relative to their baseline building was between 4 to 9 percent. The graph on the right shows which of these elements contribute most towards the hard cost. The darker color on the graph denotes higher hard cost for that element. So based on this graph, ventilation in the second row was one of the more costly elements. The survey also aimed at collecting qualitative data to understand why we chose to build a passive house, if the building is certified or not, and what were the challenges and lessons learned from the process. The main motivation to build a passive house was to reduce energy consumption and the carbon emissions. Health and comfort was also a major motivation, which can be looked a little more into detail by the next capstone team. All these graphs currently live on our analytics page on our website. That way, people can see what kind of data is being captured from the survey before they even fill it out. While it is still too early to tell, based on our preliminary findings, we see that passive house projects perform just as well, if not better than conventional buildings. Passive house design may not be significantly more expensive than conventional building construction. In our experience, large-scale project promotion resulted in more submissions than targeted outreach. Of course, more submissions are needed to collect more data and draw conclusions. If there's anything we learn from this project, it's that data collection is time consuming and can require a lot of foundational work, but it's rewarding when you see the fruits of your labor coming together. And this project will continue to live after this capstone. So there is a new capstone team that will pick up where we left off by continuing to collect more data from Passive House projects. And once more data is collected, then they'll be able to analyze trends and draw conclusions. And based on those trends, they may be able to explore beyond energy and cost saving metrics. Yeah, and we would also just like to give a huge thank you to the following individuals who were our advisors and our mentors and um, helped us and guided us every step of the way from the survey development to the website development to giving us tips on the outreach um, that we couldn't have done it without any of them. So we're very grateful for all of their help. Thank you. Great, thank, thank you. you. David or Jim, comments, questions? I'll be happy to start. Um, the website you put together looks very, very nice. Looks very professional for the survey. And I'm sure that probably convinced some people to fill it out. Um, I had a few questions. I would have uh, thought that it would, for a project like this, at least from some of the respondents, or at least some, at least one respondent, um, there would be a, a theoretical comparison of a building with calculations of what it would be um, with or without the passive design to see a comparison of what one would expect. 
uh, before going to practice. The other thing that um, is, my understanding is you got uh, five responses that you could use from different parts of the country and you compared it to some sort of overall averages. And what I'm a little worried about is the way you would design a passive house and what you would need and the types of savings are probably very, I'm guessing, would be very much climate dependent. So the way you would build a passive house in Alaska is probably different from the way you would do it in Hawaii. Um, and I'm a little concerned, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think the comparisons should always be within the same climate. So if you're comparing um, energy usage or carbon emissions uh, for a house in Minnesota, you can't compare it to an average that includes Florida. Uh, you would have to compare it to other Minnesota houses. So can you please comment whether you took that into account, whether this was done where you were comparing apples to apples? So yeah, in phase one, I know, uh, we know for sure that they did do apples to apples in New York City alone. Uh, our goal was to expand it uh, as, as wide as it could go. So all of the United States and in our data collection, we have their, uh, the climate zone as well. So in the future, when more data is collected, there can be definitely, uh, there can be apples to apples comparison based on climate zone. Um, but currently it's not, but you have these averages, like you, the graphs on the last couple of slides, which was average savings. And I assume there are similar ones for carbon emissions. Um, they were just the five you got versus the national average, as opposed to climate segregated. Because I, I even with the data that you have, even if you only have one for Minnesota, I would compare that to the average in Minnesota and not right. take the average of all five from five different climates versus a five different uh, versus the entire United States average. Right. Fair. Yeah, actually, the um, I think the, the graph that you're referring to, David, with the two comparisons, the mm -hmm. baseline um, bar that we used was used from a Manny Faye survey, which surveyed over a thousand buildings all over the country. So that already is kind of catch all um, sort of sense. So that was um, what was recommended for us to use. And that was what we were able to use um, for this project. All right, but when you only have five, you're not as weighted, equally weighted around the country as the thousand one is. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's all I had. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you. Yeah, a, a couple more sort of technical um, questions as well to help me understand. How many passive house um, projects were you able to identify in your initial research? I mean, there's, uh, there's hundreds in the country. So we, we pulled um, from FIAS, uh, which is Passive House International U.S., and also uh, the, the regular Passive House um, Institute, they, they both have servers that have um, all of the data of certified projects in the United States. So we really started with that. A lot of it was incomplete or so, some parts were incomplete and digging up contact information was sort of our larger task um, with that, but that's how, we, that's how we identified the projects. Yeah, because I, I'm assuming that you guys thought that you were going to get a fairly large number of responses to your survey. I, I assume yeah. that you were thinking, hey, we'll, we'll get 50 or maybe even 100 responses. And that yeah. will allow us to do some, you know, some, set, some statistical analysis and some, some quantitative work. When you get, I think, a, a small number of responses like you did, it might be better to kind of adapt on the fly and to say, well, since we only got five or six responses, why don't we contact the folks who responded directly? And why don't we do an interview, right? Because when you do an interview, you can get a lot more detail than you can from a, an online survey. Um, so I know that's sort of like, you know, you, you had a 
an agenda and a plan and an objective and a set of methods. But sometimes you have to kind of adapt, I think, to the circumstances here. And um, yeah, so I think the information you shared with us is, is interesting. Um, but since there only are a handful of respondents, it would be probably more helpful if we had more detailed information from those five um, sites. But, um, but no, thank you. It was very interesting. And uh, there's a lot to think about here in this, in this project. So that's all. Can, can I just add one more thing? Is that I imagine each project before it was built, um, the people who built it did a comparison of what the uh, what they expected the savings to be, well, what the extra cost was in the building, if, if any, and what they expected the savings to be. And I think it would be useful, again, as Jim just suggested, when you do the interviews, to get the theoretical predictions and compare them to what actually happened, to the practical. Because I think that would be a very useful metric um, to compare the theory, to see how good those estimates are. Um, and that way you can extrapolate. If the estimates turn out to be pretty good, then you could extrapolate to bit to other projects. Right. Yeah. yeah. Can I just jump in? Uh, so this is Jen Leone from HPD, the Capstone Advisor. And I just want to make sure everybody's aware that this team's um, Capstone project was not to actually do the analysis, but was to build a methodology for collecting it. So, you know, don't shoot the messenger, right? Th these are great ideas to take to the next level, but this team was not tasked with determining what to do with five projects and how to analyze them. But we will take these considerations to the next team, who this will be passed on to, who can actually start to figure out on a smaller sample set how better to um, analyze some of these projects. But the goal is this gets funneled into another analysis that will do that. Um, and they did, the team did collect um, the projected savings from the energy model. We just, it just wasn't shown on any of the analytics, but it's a, it's a really good suggestion. How did it compare so, with practice? Uh, well, there's a whole different analysis that we did, but they're, they're performing fairly close to what was projected by the Passive House certified energy models. But again, those are very optimistic sort of in their underlying premise. They don't necessarily model actual conditions. They model what Passive House hopes buildings will achieve. But that's a story for another time. I have a question related to uh, the long-term uh, management of, of the website. Mm -hmm. I think this is a fantastic project. And uh, after the next team, uh, you know, finishes, uh, will this be handed off to somebody who can perpetuate and maintain the data uh, collection? Uh, I know for, in our hope is that this will tie into a, another analysis that will be a funded effort. So that if funding comes through, then the team that's doing the real data analytics, which will not be me, but a team probably from Bright Power, would then be able to handle the survey. And one of the beauties of the survey that the team created is it does not require very much uh, interviewing, right? Nobody has that bandwidth. So the goal was, how do you collect the right information without having to make very long, complicated phone calls. Yeah. Um, and I think the team did a great job. If you peek into the survey, it answers really good, important questions about design that's both qualitative and quantitative. Thank so. you. No, great. I, I, I'd love to follow the website. So um, if, you, uh, if a member of the team will share that URL. Yeah, we can show it right here, right there. Great. All righty. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but we'll remember yeah. that. <laughs> we'll send it to you. <laughs> <laughs>
Nice job. All the passive house conferences are broadcasting and sharing out this link, which is super exciting. That's great. Yeah, no, you're really cutting new ground. I think this is very, very uh, crucial. So thank you. Uh, are, um, are there other questions at this point from, um, from the audience, from? The peanut gallery? Sure, I'll throw one in there. Um, for um, future groups, do you have suggestions and maybe how to increase uh, feedback from, like, you know, Amazon gift certificate or something? Or mm -hmm. that's probably being a little silly, but uh, you know, is there a way that you've, uh, probably not your purview, but maybe there's a way to helping to get more respondents? Uh, definitely the um, having, that's why we spent kind of a lot of time on the website is trying to make it a place that um, was exciting for people to submit their projects to in hopes of getting, you know, their project showcased in as one of the case studies and also, you know, having the analytics page, uh, you know, to show some examples of, of what the data could do. Um, but I think for them, I, you know, I think it's just lots of direct calls and lots of follow up and, and trying to communicate as best as they can um, how people uh, or how this is beneficial for the whole Passive House community and the world at large. Thanks. That was, it was a great presentation. It looks like some really good work you guys did. Thanks. Nice to see you guys. Well, we greatly appreciated all the team's efforts.